Good morning, my friend. I'm Dr. Lee Warren, and it is Mind Change Monday. I'm so excited to be with you for Mind Change Monday, one of my favorite days of the week. And we're going to change our minds about some ideas that I got from quantum physics today about changing the past, about being stuck with generational issues, and maybe even a, a new way to look at Einstein's mathematics around the idea of how we can make our observations fit our observed realities. We're going to address two listener questions. We're going to try to smash all that stuff together with a couple of ideas from Scripture. And we're going to do all that in the next half hour or so. But before we do any of it, I have a question for you. Hey, are you ready to change your life? If the answer is yes, there's only one rule. You have to change your mind first. And my friend, there's a place where the neuroscience of how your mind works smashes together with faith and everything starts to make sense. Are you ready to change your life? Well, this is the place, Self Brain Surgery School. I'm Dr. Lee Warren, and this is where we go deep into how we're wired, take control of our thinking, and find real hope. This is where we learn to become healthier, feel better, and be happier. This is where we leave the past behind and transform our minds. This is where we start today. Are you ready? This is your podcast. This is your place. This is your time, my friend. Let's get after it. All right, let's get after it. Hey, it was a rough weekend around here. Lisa was supposed to go to San Antonio, and we had weather that canceled her flight, and we spent a lot of time working, worrying about that. I had major dental work on Friday and just a rough night on Friday night and uh, interrupted phone calls from the ER multiple times Saturday night. We didn't get any sleep. It was just a, a weekend of changing plans and stress and medical stuff, and it was just a tough weekend. So nevertheless, the bottom line is sometimes things don't go like you plan for them to go, and it can be kind of frustrating. You feel like you're you're banging your head against the wall because you think, you have an idea, a plan, a, a purpose, a practice, and it just isn't working out. And you start to get frustrated, and you wonder why things feel so hard. Lisa and I both said it at one point. Why does everything feel so hard all the time? And I realized that I was falling into this trap of observing my life from a particular point of view and not letting a different reality that's an equally valid one but a more positive one become more real because I was observing the the difficulty rather than the solution. And so I want to use my own life as an example here and two emails from listeners this weekend that both reinforce the same idea. And we just talked on the, for the paid subscribers, we just did a bonus episode this morning about the idea that the the best time to make a change in your life, that the best time to make a particular decision is in the past, sometime before uh, there's an old Japanese saying that the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago, but the second best time is today, right now. And that's why you always hear me say at the end of every episode, the good news is you can start today. Like Whatever we decide, we can't spend any time worrying about or fretting over the fact that it could have happened at some point in the past. That uh, If I'd only made this decision 20 years ago, look how different things would be now. We can't spend any time mourning over that. Because the more you spend time thinking about something in the past that you can no longer control, the less likely you are to make changes in your life going forward so that 20 years from now you're not having the same conversation with yourself about things that you could have changed. Does that make sense? So the best time to make a change, maybe that was 20 years ago. But the second best time is right now. And that's why I always say, let's get after it. Hey, it's time to make these changes. Now, if you been listening the last week or so. We did a spiritual brain surgery episode on Thursday, on Theology Thursday, and then followed it up with Frontal Lobe Friday and Self Brain Surgery Saturday to talk about this practice of meditative prayer called Abide. I didn't know. A listener wrote in, uh, Therese wrote in and told me there's an app called Abide that apparently is about meditative prayer. That's wonderful. So check it out. I haven't looked at it myself yet, except in her email, but I'm going to check that out. It may be a great resource. Let me know if you have any experience with the Abide app, and we'll see if that turns out to be a helpful resource for all of us. But I gave you an acronym, two acronyms, actually, using the, the letters A B I D E. And we talked about just an approach to prayer. And I said, there's definitely, there's, functional imaging research from Andrew Newberg and others to show that you can make structural changes in your brain within as little as 10 to 12 minutes of meditative practice for eight weeks. 
And so let's just try it. Let's see if we can actually change our minds, change our brains, harness the power of self-directed neuroplasticity, as Jeffrey Schwartz calls it, and let's change our brains to become not just more like the mind of Christ, but actually like the brain of Christ. If Jesus had a brain that never gave in to wayward thoughts and structurally was wired for success in his thinking and taking captive his thoughts and turning thoughts into more productive things, let's get more like that. So how do we do that? Well, this abide practice can help us. And we talked about the approach, breathe, invite, depend, and experience. This idea of contemplating him, spending some time focusing on him, calming your own racing thoughts, turning down the volume on your own thinking, turning up the volume of his thinking and his voice, and learning to hear and experience and depend on him. And that abide process is a great way to get into contemplative meditative type of prayer that will structurally change your brain over a period of time. And I've heard from dozens of you. Lisa and I got maybe a hundred emails this weekend. Hey, I'm in. I'm, I'm joining you on the Abide Challenge. Let's do it. But I realized as a surgeon, like I, I can sit and think about my patient and I can study their imaging and I can research their medical history and I can study all the things that I'm trained to do and learn, read journals and learn new techniques and in my mind develop a plan for this operation. And I can do all that contemplative stuff. But at some point, as a surgeon, if I really want to take care of my patient, at some point I have to pick up the knife and make an incision and get after it and perform the operation, deepen it, expect a good outcome, rely on my training, rely on the body's ability to heal once it's put in a better state. And at some point I've got to move from contemplation to operation. That's going to be on one of our t-shirts. <laughs> I'm going to give you a t-shirt at some point that says quit contemplating and start operating. Like, like Get after it, okay? So I gave you a second acronym. Assess, like look at the situation honestly in your mind. Just be confess to God what you're actually, where you actually are. Acknowledge the situation for what it is. Zoom out and look compassionately at your own life and recognize that the way you are and the way you think and the things you're going through are a combination of your genetics and your background and your experience and prior traumas and tragedies and massive things and all of this stuff. It's not just that you're broken or you're a loser or you're whatever label you've accepted for yourself. There's a there's a history of trauma. If you get a trauma-informed mindset of yourself, not that everything's trauma, but I'm basically just saying that in the context of look at everything that's happened in your whole life and understand and assess honestly why and how and where you are right now and then believe that God has promises for you that can change your situation. If God says, hey, you have the mind of Christ, okay? You, you've you been given a different mind. You can actually learn to think differently. First Corinthians 2.16 doesn't say you might be able to develop the mind of Christ. You might someday have it. You could have it. I wish you had it. It says you have the mind of Christ. Friend, if you've accepted him, you've already been transformed. And so the problem is we're living like we don't have the mind of Christ. We're living like we're stuck with our ways of thinking, our ideas, our practices, our habits, our brokenness. And the fact is we have something better than that. So let's use this abide process to say, I'm going to assess the situation honestly. Yes, this is how I'm living. Yes, this is what's happened. Yes, this is something I could have changed or maybe should have changed years ago. But you know what? The second best time to plant a tree is right now. So God, I'm going to believe that you have promises for me that can move me from where I am in my brokenness to your life, your abundant life that you say I can have. And then I'm going to pick up the knife and we're going to make this incision, and my great physician is going to help me perform this operation that's going to change my life. And then we're going to deepen that exposure and go all the way. We're going to go all in on changing this thing. And we're going to perform this procedure. And then we're going to expect a good outcome. We're going to expect that God will give us the outcome he wants us to have. Okay, That's the second part. We're not going to contemplate anymore. We're going to operate. So we've moved from the abide of a approach, breathe, invite, depend, experience, and now we're going deeper and to assess and believe and make the incision and deepen the exposure and expect a good outcome. And we're going to abide in not just contemplating, but in operating. Does that make sense? I got two emails this weekend, one from William and one from Kathy. William said, help, please. Me and my wife are starting our morning prayer, and I finally realized the difference in prayers that seem to prevail and ones that seem to fizzle. Focus. I lose focus. 
You addressed this in previous podcasts, but please consider a deep dive into focus when praying or reading the Bible. Is the Holy Spirit the same every time? Is it up to us to maintain focus? How do we ride this bicycle? I just fell off the focus bike and trying to figure this out. What do you do when you lose focus? How do you get it back? I'm discouraged. It's one thing to be distracted, but to be distracted and discouraged is not easy to resolve. Then anxiety becomes a problem, and now it's a triple whammy. Like trying to get a, to hit a baseball after two strikes. I don't think I ever got a hit after two strikes. Why does my brain get frustrated and lose his ability? How do you return to baseline a calmer state of mind? Prayer is something we can't afford to strike out at. Like we really need God, but it's not all based on us. But how do you get the Holy Spirit to help you? I'm losing focus. Does it ever happen to you in the operating room? If not, why not? William, that's a great email. And you've described a situation perfectly here. I'm going to read an email from Kathy, and then we're going to talk about them. Kathy said, hey, Dr. Warren, I've been super excited about this abide practice. I tried it two different times, but did not get the results I was hoping for. The first time, I thought it would be a good idea to repeat the breathing statement you gave previously, to breathe in, help me see you, and breathe out in and around me. I thought if I could repeat that over and over calmly while listening to peaceful music, that would be a lovely way to abide. At the same time, I had my aura ring. That's a technology piece that you can get that will measure some of your physiologic variables like heart rate variability, temperature, and heart rate. And she says, I'm wearing my aura ring trying to do this practice, and my heart rate variability got worse, and I was disappointed. I've kept trying out different breathing practices that go with the aura ring app, and it didn't seem to do very well with these breathing practice, practice patterns. And I seem to have better results with the more relaxed approach. It definitely does not work well when I'm asked to hold my breath. I'm counting to four, but my heart rate variability is getting worse, and I'm starting to freak myself out. She didn't exactly say that, but she says, I need to either stop tracking heart rate variability or find somebody who can help me get better at breathing exercise. I'm obviously pretty intense. I may look calm on the outside, but everything is pretty intense on the inside. Thank you for that email, Kathy. Here's the, here's the commonality between Kathy and William's email. Both of them are pressing in harder to prayer and then noticing that they're struggling in one way or another and then getting frustrated about the fact that they're struggling and then focusing on the struggle and losing focus in the prayer and having trouble feeling like they can get into this relaxed state and feeling like they're able to experience the abide process like they want to. The slight differences in the two problems. William, you talk about having a hard time maintaining an intense focus in prayer. And I want to suggest to you, if we look at our brain waves, what we really are after here in a contemplative, meditative type prayer, we're actually after a losing of focus. Okay, we're actually after this idea of relaxing and getting into a state where we can calm our minds and not be so stressed and holding on so tight to the process. We're trying to direct it. We're trying to let Him come in and direct our minds to think about what He wants us to think about. If you look at your EEG, if we, if we hooked you up to a brainwave scan, that intense state of focus that I have to have in the operating room that you talked about, that's beta, okay? Beta is this sharp, focused, controlled, directed state where I'm driving my mind and making it behave and perform in a certain way. I'm focusing on this tumor or this nerve or whatever. You want your surgeon to be hyper-focused and in a beta state. But in the middle of the night when you're trying to sleep and you're beta-focused and you're super stressed out and you can't stop thinking and you can't stop worrying and you can't stop focusing, that's not a good thing. You need to be in an alpha state. You need to get your brain into a calm, relaxed state so then it can go deeper into the areas where you can actually sleep and rest and heal and recover and undergo cellular repair and all that. And the same thing is true in prayer. I think you're making a category error here where you think prayer needs to be hyper-focused and what it actually needs is to be relaxed. You need to calm your mind and let God minister to you. Now, this is obviously, we're not talking about the type of prayer where we say, hey, God, can you, you know, come in this, to this moment where I'm under attack and help me out like in a, in a real-time situation where you need God to intervene and you're, or you're interceding for somebody or something like that. You might need to be focused and in a, in a more intense state there. But we're talking about learning to be still 
and know that I am God, as he said in Psalm 46.10, knowing that you're on the way to the most stressful situation in your life and you're going to carry out the habit that Jesus carried out the night before he went to the cross, you're going to still get into a contemplative place where you can let God minister to you and prepare you for the, for the situation that you're going through. You're going to change your mind and let God do the work. So I would say probably less focus is better. Calm, relaxed. Let him uh, come in, as he says in Psalm 34, and relieve you from everything, rescue you from everything that makes you so afraid. So maybe the more you focus, the harder it is to relax, and you feel like you're losing progress because you're actually trying the wrong idea. Maybe relax and let him minister to you there. Instead of trying so hard to maintain a tight grip focus, maybe you need to let your brainwaves change to an alpha state, and he'll show you what to focus on. Try that, William. And then, Kathy, I think you're violating one of our Ten Commandments of self-brain surgery. One of them is don't make an operation out of everything. You imagine if I was in the OR, and every literally every time I did something with an instrument, I then told the anesthesiologist to take the patient out of the operating room and down to radiology to do a CAT scan so we could look at a picture of the of the procedure I just did, the one move I just made, and see how much change we've made. And then I would have to stop the operation and go do the scan and then wait for the results and then bring the patient back to the operating room and then start again and make another move and then send the patient down to radiology again. If I literally scanned the patient every time I did anything in the OR, a number of bad things would happen. First, I would never complete the operation, right? I would never get it done because I was constantly trying to scan and update and reassess and reevaluate. And instead of operating, I would be contemplating the changes instead of proceeding through the procedure. Does that make sense? So the second thing is when you're focusing on a, a physiological variable, you are more likely to stimulate that physiological variable than you are to relax it. Because now you're getting your frontal lobe involved in a very heavy way and saying, hey, what's wrong with my heart? Hey, heart, what are you doing? Why aren't you calming down? What's happening here? And you're going to strike, you're going to sort of whip the system in the opposite direction that you're trying to. And I would say if if you're overly focused on heart rate variability, take the aura ring off. Don't use it while you're doing this procedure. Relax. Let God minister to you. And what you'll see is over time, I think those physiological variables will improve for you. But if you focus on them while you're trying to learn this relaxation technique, I think you stop relaxing and start hyper-focusing on what's happening instead. And I don't think you'll ever be able to complete the operation. You can't expect a good outcome because you can't even finish the procedure because you're so focused on one physiological variable instead of the overall healing process that you're trying to get to. Does that make sense? Now, let me give you a couple of examples from quantum physics that I think are relevant to mind change here. And we'll talk for just a second about two really weird and nerdy things. We did an episode for the paid subscribers this morning about sort of this idea of quantum change. In the quantum physics world, there's two things that on the surface seem to be a little bit contradictory, but they both turn out to be crucial in learning how to predict the behavior of a system in quantum physics. Now, what do I mean by that? So Isaac Newton was the guy who figured out the basics of gravity, and he did that with studying large objects like apples and bowling balls or cannonballs or things like that. And you can predict with great accuracy using Newton's equations, his laws of motion and gravitational equations, you can predict how long it's going to take something to fall from a specific height. You can predict how far a ball is going to travel if you launch it at a certain speed and a certain angle. You can make all kinds of wonderful predictions about the world around you using Newton's equations. But what happened is they realized, Einstein and Heisenberg and others in the 20th century, realized that when you try to apply that same math to really small particles or particles that are a long way apart or traveling very fast, like the speed of light, or in a different gravitational field like outer space, those math equations that Newton came up with don't work. That they don't work to explain those systems. So Heisenberg and, and Niels Bohr and Albert Einstein and Erwin Schrodinger and all those guys did the work in the early 20th century to create the math to explain what happens at a tiny level and out in outer space. And all of those math equations depend on a whole different system that, that we now call quantum physics. And so 
when you are observing something in your life and you can't figure out why it isn't working, then the principle here is you may be using the wrong set of tools to assess what you're seeing in your life. You may need a different mindset on what you're observing and how to observe it. So we got Heisenberg here who was the first guy that came along and said, hey, if you're trying to predict how a particle or an electron or whatever is going to behave, you can never be certain of the position of that particle and its velocity at the same time. Because if, you, if you're measuring speed, then by definition, that's the change in distance over, change in position over time. And if you're measuring position, then by definition, that thing has to be still in order to know precisely where it is. Because if you, if you try to precisely measure the position of a moving object, then by the time you complete your measurement, the object has already moved to some other place, Right. Well, I want you to look at your life like that too. Like if you're if you're saying, "Well, I'm stuck. Uh, this trauma happened to me, and I'm never going to be okay. I'm never going to be able to move forward. And I, I my, my life just isn't working. And that thing happened, and my parents did this, and I inherited these genes, and and life is always so hard. And this is how it always works out for me." Then what you're doing is you're constantly observing your position as one that's stuck. And you can't notice any type of change because it, it, it's impossible to measure change while you're focused on position. And so that's Heisenberg. You can't have both. You can't have it both ways. You can't say, wow, you know, I'm not sure where I am right now in this process, but I know I'm moving. I, I know I'm moving forward. I know that I'm, my mindset is different than it was three months ago, and I started this prayer practice, and I've been doing self-brain surgery, and I, and I know that things are changing and I can't know exactly where I am, but I know I'm moving forward. And you can start giving yourself some grace, and then that Heisenberg uncertainty principle can start working positively for you, right? Well, quantum Zeno is this thing that's sort of like a, the old saying, a watched pot never boils. Quantum Zeno is this effect that says the more you look at something in a particular mindset, if you study an electron and you set up an experiment to measure that electron and to find out if it's going to behave like a wave when it moves— then all of your observations will verify that it turns out to be a wave. And if you study the, you set up the experiment to say, I want to prove that electrons are particles, that they move like particles, that, that they're going to go in a straight line, you set your experiment up to measure that, then all of your observations will prove out that the electron is in fact a particle. But if you set your experiment up to observe it as possibly is this a wave or a particle, then the results are going to verify that electrons and photons and light actually behave as if they were particles and waves at the same time. The quantum Zeno effect says the more you look at something from a particular observational viewpoint, the more likely it is to behave and stay in that state. And so I know that sounds super nerdy, but here's the bottom line. If you look at your life, and you constantly make observations to see, am I still stuck? Yep, I'm still stuck. Am I still, is my heart rate variability still bad? Yep, it sure is. Now I'm worried about that. I'm going to observe it again. Oh, it's still bad. 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 You're watching the pot, and it's never going to boil because you're keeping it stuck in a state of your own observation. I know that sounds weird, but think about your life for a minute, okay? If you come to your looking at your life from your eyes, from your point of view, from the way you've always thought about yourself, and you say, am I still hopelessly broken and grieving and stuck? Yep, I sure am. I feel just like I did yesterday. Then what's going to happen? Well, I guess I'll do the same things that I did yesterday to make sure that that state stays the same. I'm going to watch the same television shows and drink the same alcohol and and sit on the same couch and, and do all the same things. And then guess what's going to happen tomorrow when I observe? Am I still the same way? Yep, I sure am. Nothing changed. Because if you don't change something, you're choosing it, right? And the truth is, the, the quantum Zeno effect would say, if you change your perspective and you say, wait a minute, if I, if I spend this half hour today and I listen to this podcast or I, I read my Bible and I pray and give God something, and I make a decision that for today, I'm going to decide for, for, for the next hour not to turn the television on or not to open that bottle of wine. I'm going to go outside and take a walk instead. Then tomorrow, I'm going to observe this, observe this situation again. I'm going to say, you know what? Yesterday, something was different. 
I slept a little bit better. Yesterday, I was able to give God some things and, and take them off my plate, and I was able to move my body a little bit, and hey, I noticed that my knees don't hurt quite as much. And I'm observing that my reality, in fact, changed a little bit. And then because of Hebb's law, which is this directed neuroplasticity law that says neurons that fire together wire together, but you say, well, you know what, I, feel, I do feel a little bit different today. And if I do that again today, if I repeat that same set of little incremental changes that I made yesterday, then tomorrow the effect will be a little bit more hardwired and it'll get a little easier. And we know that when you make those hard decisions and you do hard things that your mid anterior cingulate gets stronger and you develop more willpower and it becomes easier to do a hard thing next time without struggling so much to get it done. And so all of a sudden you're saying, wait, I I may not be in the same place I was. When I observe that, the place that I'm in seems a little bit different than it did. And I'm going to keep observing that incremental change. And now what's going to start to become ingrained and start to become real is the fact that I'm noticing that I am moving. And it may be little. It may be small. Maybe I didn't plant that tree 20 years ago. I just planted it today. But you know what? I'm starting to see a little leaf grow out of it. And then you're going to start to to buy into the idea that change is actually possible for you, my friend. You're going to harness the power of quantum physics and harness the power of the fact that you actually have the mind of Christ and that you can do all things who gives you strength. And you're going to start seeing some things change. There's some fascinating research, something called transgenerational biology. And it's been now shown there's a the guy named Oded Rakavi, a scientist in Israel that's done some fascinating research in, in worms. He's got this particular nematode worm that has a three-day life cycle. And so you can easily measure genetic changes because generations happen multiple times every day. So he's using them to study the fact that it now seems possible that you can inherit memories from your parents. Now, we've known for a long time that Holocaust survivors and PTSD victims or PTSD veterans from Vietnam can actually pass things they're afraid of and negative experiences that they've had and biases and baseline fears to their generations, three and four generations down. We've seen that in mice. You can stimulate a mice, a mouse and give them a, a, a shock, a painful shock when they smell a certain thing, and their offspring will be born afraid of the smell of that thing. And then if you teach that offspring that that thing isn't harmful, then their offspring won't be afraid of that smell anymore. It's, it, this is transgenerational biology, and Oded Rakabi's lab is showing that there are some genetic changes that you inherit from your parents. And they're not genes that can't be switched on and off, but the baseline way that you start your life can be influenced by the memories of your parents. Okay? So this is important when we get into Scripture and we start reading things. There's a there's a book by a listener. Um, I recently connected with a therapist, and her name is um, uh, Gina Berkmeyer. Sorry, my computer glitched there, and I couldn't read for a second. Gina Berkmeyer is, is a licensed therapist, and she wrote a book called Generations Deep, and it's about these generational traumas. And, and she wrote in to me, and we have a lot of the same ideas, and really fascinating. I'm reading her book now. But she starts off with this scripture that talks about the fact that God in the Old Testament, two different, several different places, talks about how there are some things that happen in families over time that seem like a curse from God, and often we're, we teach them that way. Exodus 34, 7, the sins of the father visited upon the third and fourth generation of the son. And it sounds like God's being vindictive, that if your, your dad screws up, he's going to punish your great-grandchildren. But what if that's not the way he means it? What if God was giving us an insight into transgenerational biology? What if God was giving us an insight into what we think are generational curses, but they're not punishments from God. They're the natural, genetic things that happen in families when parents undergo major trauma or commit sins or have problems that they don't deal with. I saw a quote the other day from somebody, and I can't place where I saw it, but if you don't heal the problems that your inner child has, you will create them in the child that comes out of you. If you don't fix the problem of the child inside you, you will give it to the child that comes out of you. That's a generational curse, okay? And Gina says, what doesn't get healed gets repeated. What doesn't get repaired gets repeated. 
So what if this scripture then is talking about not a curse from God, but a reality of our biology and our inheritance and our genetic baseline? So I'm telling you that because of this. So there are some things, there are some realities in your life that you may not be responsible for. Maybe it's not your fault that you're afraid or you deal with anxiety or that you struggle with a particular thing or that you have made the same mistake over and over. But what happens is once you recognize it, once you understand it, you can start to take the shackles off of it. Once you understand that something is limiting you and hindering you and that maybe you got it because of some situation that happened that was out of your control, well, guess what? Now you have the ability to do something about it. Now, you can begin to observe your reality in a different way. Now you can begin to make those quantum changes that will produce real changes in your life. Does that make sense? So let's get in a more relaxed brain state. Let's change our minds from beta to alpha. Let's start observing and abiding and stop contemplating so much and start operating and actually start making changes because the best time to make a change, maybe that was 20 years ago. Maybe it was five years ago. Maybe it was six months ago. But the second best time is right now. We're going to go deeper and deeper and deeper into these ideas in coming months. It's going to make a massive change in your life if you'll let it, if you'll learn to abide and stop just contemplating, but also start operating and stop focusing, stop making an operation out of everything and start letting the healing process happen over time because you're observing yourself from a different reality and you're recognizing that there's a difference between the mind that you're living in and the mind of Christ that you actually have, and there's a way to get there from here. And hope is defined as the belief that you can get there from here. And we're going to do all that And we're going to do it, my friend, starting today. Hey, thanks for listening. The Dr. Lee Warren Podcast is brought to you by my brand new book, Hope is the First Dose. It's a treatment plan for recovering from trauma, tragedy, and other massive things. It's available everywhere books are sold. And I narrated the audio books. Hey, The theme music for the show is Get Up by my friend Tommy Walker, available for free at TommyWalkerMinistries.org. They are supplying worship resources for worshipers all over the world to worship the Most High God. And if you're interested in learning more, check out TommyWalkerMinistries.org. If you need prayer, go to the prayer wall at WLeeWarrenMD.com slash prayer, WLeeWarrenMD.com slash prayer, and go to my website and sign up for the newsletter, Self Brain Surgery, every Sunday since 2014, helping people in all 50 states and 60 plus countries around the world. I'm Dr. Lee Warren, and I'll talk to you soon. Remember, friend, you can't change your life until you change your mind. And the good news is you can start today.